Welcome to this, uh, the fundamentals of transport processes. This is lecture number 15 and we are well on our way to solving problems in unidirectional flows. We had looked in series at a series of problems of, of increasing complexity. The first few were just uh, flow uh, transport between two flat plates where the temperature, the concentration or the velocity was at two different values between the two plates and so there was a transfer of momentum, energy or concentration from the region of higher velocity, temperature or concentration to a lower value. Okay. And then we were looking at some problems where there is a source or sink within the flow. In this case, there is momentum generated due to forces acting on the fluid itself. Alternatively, there could be a source of mass due to a reaction taking place within the fluid or a source of heat due to various reasons. One could be because of reactions exothermic or endothermic resulting in an increase or decrease in temperature. There could also be phase transformations which re result in a release of latent heat. And I had also briefly told you that there could be viscous heating due to the shear stress in the flow itself. So, in this series of problems where there is a source or sink of mass, momentum or energy within the flow, the first situation we had considered was a body force, a gravitational force acting on a fluid that is flowing down an inclined plane. Okay. So, the problem we considered was the flow down an inclined plane and there is a gravitational force acting on every element of fluid within the flow. That gravitational force has a component along the flow direction. Okay. Uh, this component is of course, um, if I resolve it into components along and perpendicular, I will get a component both along and perpendicular to the flow direction. The component of the gravitational force along the flow direction is what results in the fluid flow and that exerts a force within the fluid itself. Okay. And therefore, we have an equation with an inhomogeneous term here. This is an inhomogeneous term which is generating the fluid flow within the uh, due to the force exerted on each volume element of fluid within the flow. So, this is like a source of momentum and from that we had calculated what was the velocity field due to that. Okay, at steady state, we get the solution quite easily. Uh, the important point is we have to impose a zero shear stress condition at the surface. If the surface is between uh, uh, liquid and air, then the viscosity of air is much smaller than the viscosity of liquid. Due to that, the air cannot exert a shear stress on the liquid and due to that, we have to uh, ensure that the shear stress at the surface is equal to zero. And on that basis, we had got this velocity profile okay, for the flow. Now, another case where there is a force exerted on e every volume element of fluid is the pressure driven flow in a channel. Pressure driven flows in channels and pipes are widely encountered. For example, if you want to pump fluid to an overhead tank, there is a pressure gradient that is generated which results in the pumping of fluid to that tank. Of course, that pressure difference has to account for the potential energy of lifting the water all the way to the tank, but also for the friction losses okay, due to the flow in the pipe. Okay. So, because of that, you will have a pressure gradient which exerts a force on the fluid and we will look at how to analyze that situation in two respects. One is the flow itself, the flow profile itself and the second is the viscous heat generated due to the velocity profile. Okay. So, this is a pressure driven flow in a channel. Okay. This channel is in between two flat plates. So, let us draw the configuration here. You have two plates, one is at z is equal to 0, 
the other z z is equal to h okay. and these are solid plates we will assume that they are, they are of infinite extent into the board this is the x coordinate this is the z coordinate and then we have to do find out what is the velocity profile within this channel. Okay. Now obviously this flow is being generated because there is a difference in the pressure between the inlet and the outlet. Okay. There is a difference in the pressure between the inlet and the outlet and that is what is generating a velocity profile. Okay. So the pressure at each and every cross section in the x direction is not a constant the pressure is steadily decreasing as you go downstream. Okay. So, how do we do the momentum balance? We use a shell balance once again. Okay. Of uh, thickness delta x, delta y, delta z. Okay. And the balance equation is the same. The rate of change of momentum is equal to the sum of forces. Okay. Previously, I had separated out forces into two types. One was body forces and the other was surface forces. In this particular case, for simplicity, we will assume that there are no gravitational forces exerted on the fluid. Okay. So, we will neglect body forces for the time being and consider only surface forces. Okay. The rate of change of momentum within this differential volume is given by rho ux at x y z t plus delta t minus ux at x y z t. This is the momentum per unit volume and therefore, I have to multiply this by the volume. Okay, so, the rate of change of momentum, change in momentum per unit time multiplied by the volume. This is equal to the sum of forces. Now, what are the forces that are acting on the fluid? Let us go back to the configuration. Okay. First thing, we are in a steady state configuration, so there is no time variation. Okay. And secondly, the flow is fully developed that means that the velocity profile is the same at each and every cross section within the flow. The velocity profile does not change. Therefore, u x is independent of x. It depends only upon z. Since we have assumed that the plate is infinite in the perpendicular direction in the y direction, there is no variation in y either. Okay. This is different from the flow in a pipe which will, we will see a little later. In a pipe, it is cylindrical and therefore, there is a variation from the center of the pipe towards the wall. Okay. In this case, the variation is only in the x direction and not in the z direction. Okay. So, if I take this differential volume here. Okay, If I take this differential volume, delta x, delta y, delta z, the shear stress is acting in the x direction. So, tau x z, which is equal to mu times d u x by d z is equal to force in x direction at surface with normal in z direction. This is the force per area. Okay. 
acting at a surface whose unit, unit normal is in the z direction. At the upper surface, the unit normal is in the plus z direction. Therefore, the force exerting here is tau xz. I had explained to you earlier that when you reverse the direction of the unit normal, the direction of the force also reverses. So, at the bottom surface, unit normal is in the minus z direction. Therefore, the force is minus tau xz. Okay. So, I have the shear stresses acting on the top and the bottom surfaces. Okay. So, the force exerted due to the shear stresses is going to be equal to tau xz at the top surface into the area. The area of the top surface is delta x times delta y, okay. delta x delta y. Okay. At the bottom surface, the shear stress is minus tau x z. Okay. So, I will get minus tau x z at z delta x delta y. Okay, so, that is the force acting on the top and the bottom surfaces. However, I told you that there is a pressure gradient along the pipe as well. Okay. The pressure at each location is not the same. Pressure is higher on the left hand side, it is lower on the right hand side and that is what is driving the flow through the tube. Okay. So, in addition, there are also pressure forces acting on these differential volumes. Okay. There are pressure forces acting on every surface. On all six surfaces of this differential volume, you will have pressure forces. However, for the top and bottom, there is no difference in pressure because I have not imposed a pressure gradient there. For the front and back, there is no difference in pressure because there is no pressure gradient. However, along the pipe, along the x direction, there is a pressure gradient. Therefore, the pressure at x is different from the pressure at x plus delta x. So, therefore, for this differential volume, I also have pressure forces acting. Okay. There is a pressure acting at x, okay. at the surface at x, there is a pressure acting that is acting in the plus x direction. Okay. Pressure always acts inward to the differential volume that I am considering. It is a compressive force, it acts inward. So, the pressure acting inward at x, which is in the plus x direction, is the pressure acting inward at x plus delta x, okay, which is acting in the minus x direction. Okay. So, these two pressure forces also enter into the momentum balance equation. Okay. So, the pressure force at x is in the plus x direction, P at x. Okay times the surface area which is delta y delta z minus p at x plus delta x delta y into delta z. Okay. So, in addition to the shear stresses, whenever I have flow in a pipe or a channel, there are also pressure forces acting and these pressure forces are what are driving the flow okay, in this case. So, to get the balance equations, I once again divide by delta x, delta y, delta z. Okay. And then I will get the differential equation rho times ux at t plus delta t minus ux at t. by delta t is equal to p at x minus p at x plus delta x divided by delta x plus the shear stress tau x z at z plus delta z minus tau x z at z by delta z. So, that is now my momentum balance equation and taking the limit delta x, delta y, delta z and delta t going to 0, 
the balance equation becomes rho times d u x by d t is equal to. The second term here is p at x plus delta x minus p at x. Okay. So, this is equal to minus d p by d x okay. and the last term is tau x z at z plus delta z minus tau x z at z which is partial tau x z by partial z. So, that is my momentum balance equation rho times d u x by d t is equal to minus d p by d x. This is the additional term that comes in due to the pressure gradient. Okay. This is the additional term that comes in due to the pressure gradient. Previously, we had a body force term. In this case, there is a pressure gradient because the applied pressure on the two ends of the tube are different. Okay. So, and then I can use Newton's law for viscosity tau x z is equal to mu times d u x by d z okay, to get rho d u x by d t is equal to minus d p by d x plus mu d square u x by d z square. So, this is the balance equation okay, and it contains this pressure gradient which is an imposed pressure gradient. Okay, it is an imposed pressure gradient which is a constant along the length of the tube and this is what is driving the flow. Okay. Note that the effect of the pressure gradient is remarkably similar to the effect of a body force. Okay. If we go back to the equation for the flow down a plane, okay, I had a similar equation d u x by d t is equal to the convective viscosity times d square u x by d z square plus an additional term which is g times sin theta. In the case of a pressure driven flow, I get a term that is exactly similar to this okay, except that it is a pressure gradient and not a body force. So, the effect of a pressure difference across the tube is similar to the effect of a body force acting on each element of the fluid. I could also write this in, in terms of the kinematic viscosity d u x by d t is equal to minus 1 over rho d p by d x plus the kinematic viscosity d square u x by d z square. Okay. And at steady state, okay, at steady state, d u x by d t is equal to 0 and therefore, my equation just becomes minus 1 over rho d p by d x plus nu d square u x by d z square is equal to 0. Okay. Okay. So, this is the momentum balance equation and I had two boundaries for the channel. Okay. Uh, this is at z is equal to 0, z is equal to h and the center line of the channel was at z is equal to h by 2. Okay. So, my boundary conditions require that the velocity is equal to the wall velocity at the two surfaces. Okay. At the two surfaces at u x is equal to 0 at z is equal to 0, u x is equal to 0 at z is equal to h. So, those are the boundary conditions that I have to solve this equation subject to. Okay. Note that once again this is an inhomogeneous equation. Okay, it contains an inhomogeneous term here. Okay. So, there is no forcing at the walls. The velocity at both the boundaries are identically equal to 0. So, both the boundary conditions are both homogeneous. 
However, there is a steady forcing within the equation itself due to the pressure gradient that is applied across the length of the tube. Okay. Scaling, obviously z star is equal to z by h. Okay. How about the velocity u x? Once again, the velocity u x has to come from the conservation equation itself. Okay. Because if I write down minus 1 by rho d p by d x plus nu by h square d square u x by d z star square is equal to 0. Okay. And then I can divide throughout by this term here okay. and set it equal to 1. Okay. So, therefore, I will get minus 1 plus minus 1 plus u I write this as a total viscosity mu by h square into d p by d x whole inverse d square u x by d z star square is equal to 0. Therefore, I can define a non-dimensional non velocity u x star is equal to mu u x by h square into d p by d x whole inverse. Okay, so, that is my definition of a non-dimensional velocity in terms of the pressure gradient. As I said, there is a constant pressure gradient along the entire length of the tube. Okay. So, therefore, the velocity has to be scaled by that pressure gradient to get a non-dimensional velocity. So, this gives us the scaling for the velocity. Okay. That means, that the velocity will go as d p by d x times h square by mu. Okay. So, if I apply a pressure gradient, the velocity along the tube is going to go as the pressure gradient times h square divided by mu. So, this gives me a scale for the velocity. Okay. And once I put that in, the equation just becomes d square u x by d z square minus 1 is equal to 0. Okay. With boundary conditions, u x is equal to 0 at z is equal to 0 and u x is equal to 0 at z is equal to 1. This equation is easily solved. Okay. It is a second order differential equation whose solution is quite easy to get. Okay. The solution is just of the form u x is equal to z square by 2 plus c 1 z plus c 2, where the constant c 1 and c 2 are to be determined from the boundary conditions at z is equal to 0 and z is equal to 1. Okay. And these c 1 and c 1 and c 2 can be determined quite easily. And finally, I will get an expression for u x which will be equal to z square by 2 minus z by 2. Okay. So, that is the final equation for the velocity profile. It is a parabolic velocity profile within the, uh, within the channel. Okay. The velocity is equal to 0 at both z is equal to 0 and at z is equal to 1. So, the velocity is equal to 0 at both z is equal to 0 and z is equal to 1. At the center of the channel at z is equal to half, the derivative of the velocity is equal to 0. So, I get a parabolic profile that looks something like this in the channel. Okay. And this parabolic profile is characteristic of all pressure driven flows. We will see a little later than when we do the flow in a pipe that you get a parabolic flow in that case as well. So, now I can express this back in terms of a dimensional velocity. Okay. To get a dimensional velocity, 
all I need to do is multiply it by dP by dx times h square by mu. Okay. So, my dimensional velocity will just be equal to dP by dx into h square by mu into z star square by 2 minus z star by 2. Okay. And this is equal to minus 1 by 2 mu dP by dx into z into z minus h. Okay. So, this is the parabolic velocity profile uh, for the flow in a channel, it is called the plane Poiseuille flow. Okay, the parabolic profile for the flow in a channel. Okay. Now, this can also be written in terms of the mean velocity. Okay. If I take for example, the maximum velocity at the center of the channel. Okay. So, at the center of the channel z is equal to h by 2. Okay. So, u x will be equal to minus 1 over 2 mu into d p by d x okay, into h square by 4, okay, which is equal to the velocity u at the center of the channel. So, this is the maximum velocity okay. at the center of the channel, the maximum velocity u is equal to is given in terms of the pressure gradient by this expression. Okay. So, I could also express the velocity u x in terms of the velocity at the center of the channel, the maximum velocity. Okay. So, u x in terms of the maximum velocity is equal to 4 u into z by h minus z by h the whole square, okay, where where u is equal to this expression, the maximum velocity at the center of the channel. Okay. So, that is the velocity profile under a pressure gradient okay, for the flow in a channel. And uh, as I said, the velocity is remarkably similar to the velocity under the, uh, under the application of a gravitational force. Okay. If we go back to the previous example, The velocity in this case was also parabolic. Okay, the velocity in this case was also parabolic, except that it had a derivative equal to zero at the top surface. Okay, it had a derivative equal to zero at the top surface. That is because we had imposed a zero shear stress condition at the top surface. Okay, whereas for our flow in a channel, the shear st the velocity was equal to zero on both sides. The solution was parabolic except that it came back to 0 at both walls. Okay. So, that is the only difference. If instead of having uh, a free surface at the top, if I had had a flat solid wall at the top, I would have got the exact same velocity profile except that it would have been parabolic and come back to 0 because I required to enforce the 0 velocity condition at the top surface if the flow is in between two flat surfaces. Okay. So, instead of the gravitational force here between two flat surfaces tending to flow the fluid down the slope, I instead have a pressure difference which is tending to flow fluid down the slope. Okay, so, that is the only difference. So, pressure differences and body forces act in a very similar manner. Now, this problem of the flow in a channel, we have used it to determine what is the velocity profile in this flow. Okay. Another situation we could consider is the effect of viscous heating due to viscosity within the flow. Okay. So, in that case, because of the flow, there is a source of energy and that tends to heat up 
the, the channel okay. and the objective is to find what is the temperature okay, due to this viscous heating within the channel. Okay. So, let us look at that problem which is now a problem of a source of heat okay, within the channel. Okay. So, this is the problem of viscous heating. in the channel. Okay. So, I am given a velocity profile, okay. this is x, this is z. Okay. I know that the velocity profile is given by this profile. and I want to know what is the temperature. Okay. So, we are maintaining for example, uh, in a heat exchanger problem, we maintain the temperature T is equal to T naught on both walls and we would like to know what is the temperature within the fluid due to the viscous heating. Okay. So, that is the problem. We will not derive in detail here, but the source of energy due to viscous heating okay, uh, is given by the source per unit volume is equal to the shear stress times the velocity gradient. Okay, the source of heating per unit volume, energy generated per unit volume per unit time is the product of the shear stress and the strain rate. Okay. And we will assume that this formula for the shear stress and strain rate is given to us. Okay. So, we will not try to obtain it. Okay. So, with this expression for the, for, for the rate of viscous heating, okay. the heat transfer equation is of the form d t by d t is equal to the thermal diffusivity d square t by d z square plus a c. with boundary conditions T is equal to T naught at Z is equal to 0 and is equal to T naught at Z is equal to H. Okay. So, those are the boundary conditions. So, using these I have to solve this equation. Okay. Scaling as usual we can define the Z coordinate as Z star is equal to Z by H. what is the scaling for the temperature. Okay. So, for simplicity I will define the scaling here for the temperature as T star is equal to T minus T naught divided by T naught, the fractional rise in temperature due to the viscous heating. Okay. We will work with this and then we will see that we will get a dimensionless number which gives you the rate of viscous heating as compared to the temperature rise. Okay. So, So, inserting this into this equation okay, and assuming steady state. Okay, so, at steady state, d t by d t is equal to 0. Okay, so, there is a steady configuration and there is viscous heating. So, my differential equation becomes alpha d square t by d z square plus s e is equal to 0. Now, what is the source? Okay. I told you that S e was equal to tau x y times, uh, I should be careful here, tau x z times d u x by d z. Okay. But from Newton's law of viscosity, tau x z is just equal to mu times d u x by d z. Right. So, I can write this as mu times d u x by d z the whole square. Okay, so, that is my expression for the viscous heating per unit volume per unit time in the energy balance equation. the thermal conductivity. Okay. Now, 
Now, we know that u x is equal to 4 u into z by h minus z by h the whole square, okay, which means that d u x by d z is equal to 16 u square by h square by 16 u by h. One minus two z by h. Therefore, S E will be equal to I should write this as four. Sixteen u square by h square into one minus 2 z by h the whole square okay, which is equal to 16 u square by h square into 1 minus 2 z star whole square. Okay, so, that is the final expression for the rate of production of energy okay. and if I put that into my conservation equation I have k times d square t by t z square plus 16 u square by h square into 1 minus 2 z star the whole square is equal to 0. So, this is my energy conservation equation in the presence of viscous heating within the flow. Scalings I defined z star is equal to z by h and t star is equal to t minus t naught by t naught. Okay. So, that I have t star is equal to 0 at both boundaries. Okay. With that scaling, you can write this as k t naught by h square d square t star by d z star square plus 16 u square by h square to 1 minus 2 16 mu. is equal to 0. Okay. And I can divide throughout by this first factor okay, in order to get an equation of the form d square t by d z square plus a dimensionless number, okay, a dimensionless number times 1 minus 2 z star square is equal to 0. This number is usually defined with a prefactor, so I will just leave that definition of the prefactor there. I will leave that definition of the prefactor there. Okay. It's a mistake here. Okay, so I will define it with the prefactor, where this thing, okay. This dimensionless number is given by mu u square by k t naught. Okay. Uh, it is sometimes called the Brinkman number. I okay. will just leave it as a dimensionless number here. Okay. So, this basically gives me the ratio of viscous heating to the temperature rise due to a temperature difference proportional to t naught. The mu u square is the rate of energy generation per unit volume okay, due to viscous heating, okay, mu u square by h square and k t naught by h square is the rate of change of energy within a volume if there were a temperature gradient of uh, magnitude t naught over a distance h. Okay, so, that is the physical significance of this dimensionless number. This equation can be easily solved to get the temperature profile. Okay, the final solution for this equation is T star will be equal to this Brinkman number into 8 z 1 minus z star 1 minus 2 
z star plus 2 z star square by 3. Okay, that is the final solution for the temperature increase. Okay. And if you actually plot out this temperature profile, okay, okay. this temperature across the channel, it has to come to 0 at the two walls. Okay at the center of the channel itself it is very flat. Okay. The temperature actually looks something like this. Okay. So, this is the temperature as a function of the height okay, in the function of z. This shows you the temperature profile. It is much flatter than the parabolic profile for the velocity itself. The reason is because at the center of the channel the shear stress goes to 0. The slope of the velocity is equal to 0 at the center of the channel therefore, d u x by d z is equal to 0 at the center of the channel. Therefore, at the center of the channel there is no viscous heating okay? and because of that you do not have any variations in temperature right at the center. At the walls of course, the shear stress is, 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 uh, is non-zero. In fact, the shear stress the slope of the velocity profile is largest at the walls because of that the heating is also largest at the walls and therefore, you have the largest temperature difference at the walls. Now, one can define calculate the heat flux okay, q z is equal to minus k times d t by d z. Okay. This is true of any location okay, q z is equal to minus k times d t by d z. Okay. I can write this in terms of the dimensionless uh, variables t star and z star as minus k t naught by h t t star by t z star. Okay. And if I put in my expression for the heat uh, for the temperature profile here, okay. if I put in this expression for the temperature profile. what you get is that q z is equal to eight k t naught by three h into one minus two z star the whole cubed okay into the Brinkman number okay. Alternatively I can write it in terms of the viscosity and the velocity of the fluid just from my definition of the Brinkman number mu u by k t naught as 8 mu u square by 3 h into 1 minus 2 z the whole square the whole cube I am sorry. Okay. Clearly this is a maximum at z is equal to 0 and at z is equal to z star is equal to 1. At the top and the bottom surfaces where z star is equal to 0 and at the top surface where z star is equal to 1, this heat flux is a maximum. Okay. It is going outwards. Okay. That means, that it goes downwards at z star is equal to um, 0 uh, and therefore, should go uh, upwards at z star is equal to plus 1. At the center itself the flux is equal to 0. At the center z star is equal to half and therefore, the flux is equal to 0 okay, at the center itself and that was because the velocity gradient is 0 at the center as I had explained to you a little earlier. So, the maximum heat flux due to viscous heating q z is equal to 8 mu u square by 3 h. Okay. That is the maximum heat flux due to viscous heating okay. and uh, this heat flux actually has relevance in the context of uh, the heat exchanger problem that we had solved in the second or the third lecture. Okay. If you recall we had solved this problem 
using dimensional analysis. In this problem, when we did the dimensional analysis, we had separated out the quantities into thermal and mechanical quantities. Okay. We had said that there is no interconversion of energy from thermal to mechanical energy. Okay. Strictly speaking, I had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 9 variables and 4 dimensions. So, I should have been able to get 5 dimensionless groups in this problem. Okay. However, I said if there is no conversion, interconversion of energy from thermal to mechanical, then I can consider heat energy to be separate from mechanical energy. Okay. And if heat energy is considered to be separate from mechanical energy, then I have five dimensions because heat energy is a separate dimension. And I have five dimensions, nine dimensional groups, that means that I have only four dimensionless groups which ultimately we identified as the Nusselt number, the Reynolds number, the Prandtl number and the ratio d by L. Okay. So, the assumption here is that heat and mechanical energy are separate, there is no interconversion and therefore, I can write a balance for the heat energy alone. Okay. I do not need to consider the fact that mechanical energy can be interconverted into heat energy. Okay. In the problem that we just solved, in the problem that we had just in the problem that we, we had just solved, I told you what is the heat energy generated due to viscous heating. This heat energy generated due to viscous heating represents an interconversion of energy between mechanical energy and heat energy. Okay. Therefore, I can consider heat energy to be separate only if this, this flux due to viscous heating is small compared to the flux due to temperature difference. Across the wall, across the tube wall. Okay. So, it is only under these conditions that I can consider the heat energy and the mechanical energy to be two different things and write different balances for these. Okay. What is the flux due to the temperature difference? Q z is equal to k delta T by delta z, where delta z is the thickness of the tube. Okay. Therefore, I require that mu u square by 3 h is small compared to k delta d by delta z. Okay. In order to be able to neglect the viscous heating in comparison to the actual energy transfer across the tube wall. The energy transfer across the tube wall just depends upon the wall thickness. Okay. So, this is just equal to the thickness of the wall. Okay. Whereas, the viscous heating energy depends upon the thickness of the entire tube. Okay. The thickness of the entire tube is usually small compared to the wall thickness. Okay. And therefore, my requirement is that delta T has to be large compared to mu u square h w by h times k. So, only if this temperature difference is large compared to the temperature that is generated due to viscous heating, will I be able to neglect viscous heating in comparison to uh, the heat exchange due to the temperature difference across the tube. Okay. And it is only in that case that uh, the assumption that the heat energy is separate from mechanical energy is a valid one. Okay. So, that depends upon as I said on this Brinkman number, okay. this number that I have if I assume that delta T is of the same magnitude as T w, then the Brinkman number gives me the ratio of viscous heating and the heat generated due to temperature differences, if delta T is of the same magnitude as T w. Okay. And uh, if the Brinkman number is small, then I can neglect okay, the heating due to viscous uh, friction 
in comparison to the heating due to um, the, the heat flux due to a temperature difference across the tube. Okay. So, we solved problems where there are sources and sinks for momentum transfer. We solved two problems. One is where there is a body force which tends to force the fluid and the other is where there is a pressure difference across the ends which results in a pressure gradient along the tube. Okay. I showed you that the effect of the pressure gradient is can is, is effectively is equivalent to the pressure due to a body force acting on the fluid. And then we solved a problem here of the temperature, the heat generated due to the viscous flow within the channel. Okay. In a similar manner, one can write down equations for the concentration field as well. Okay. We had seen the concentration equation a little earlier. Okay. Dc by dz is equal to d d square c by dz square plus any source or sink. Okay. In the concentration equation, the source of mass or the sink of mass is due to uh, chemical reaction okay. and therefore, the source or sink will depend upon the reaction rate and the concentration. Okay. The source and sink are usually of the form source is equal to either K C A minus K C if C is concentration of a reactant or it will be equal to plus K times C if C is the concentration of a product. So, this is for first order reactions. Okay. If the reaction is second order, then it will go as C square. Okay. If it is an nth order reaction, it will go as C power n. Okay. The equation continues to be linear only if the reaction is first order. Okay. If the reaction is second order, the equation is no longer a linear equation. Okay. So, you have to have some special ways of solving the equation if it is a higher order reaction. Okay. However, if the reaction is first order, there is an easy way to solve it. Okay. The reaction at steady state d d square c by d z square minus k c is equal to 0. Okay. And from the reaction rate and the diffusion constant, you end up getting a length scale out. Okay. So, if I divide throughout by the diffusion constant, I get d square c by d z square is minus k by d c is equal to 0. Okay. If I define c star is equal to c by c naught, okay. I get a length scale out of here. Okay. z star is equal to z times k by d power half. This is non-dimensional because k is a reaction rate. It has dimensions of time inverse and d is a diffusion coefficient. It has dimensions of length square per unit time. So, this z star has is a dimensionless number. Okay. So, this dimensionless number comes out of the analysis and my equation becomes partial square c star by partial z star square minus c star is equal to 0. Okay. So, this has exponentially increasing and decreasing solutions. Okay, this equation has exponential solutions. Okay. So, this length scale is effectively a penetration depth the depth to which a perturbation to the concentration at a given surface will penetrate within the flow. Okay. So, if this penetration depth is small compared to the macroscopic length scale, then the effect of any concentration field at the bottom will be felt only to within a finite depth within the fluid. Okay. So, this thing acts as a penetration depth within the flow. Important point to note is that in this case where we have a reaction and a diffusion system simultaneously, the fact that you have reaction as well and that reaction rate depends upon concentration. In the previous case for viscous heating, the heat the heating rate did not depend upon temperature. So, it was independent of temperature. In this case, reaction rates usually depend upon concentration of reactants or products. Okay. 
So, if it depends upon concentration, you get out a penetration depth okay, from this exercise. Okay. So, uh, so there is an additional length scale that comes into play apart from the length in the length uh, from the width of the channel. In the case of flow in a channel, that was the only length scale in the problem. In this case, there is an additional length scale, which is the uh, which is related to the ratio of the reaction rate and the diffusion coefficient. Physically, the system, uh, the concentration diffuses from the surface, but it is also getting con consumed within the flow. And therefore, because of that, it will penetrate only to a finite depth within the flow. Okay. So, that is a characteristic of uh, diffusion problems in uh, diffusion reaction problems in mass transport. There is an additional complication in mass transport problems and that is that one has to account for the center of mass velocity. Okay. The, the flux, if the concentration of the, the, the mass being transported is, is small, then its transport does not result in a velocity of the center of mass. But if it is finite, there is a center of mass velocity. We look briefly at that center of mass velocity in the beginning of the next lecture and then we will go on to analyzing problems in cylindrical coordinates. So, this completes sources and sinks within the flow for unidirectional transport in Cartesian coordinates. The next is to go to cylindrical coordinates. Before that, we will just briefly look at mass transfer problems. So, we will see you in the next lecture.